Praise God. Well, I am, um, I'm going to ask you to turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 10. As you're standing, would you just turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 10. We're in a series entitled Friend of Sinners, Friend of Sinners. Now, I just, I just want to, um, I just want to read one phrase, hallelujah, and that's, if I can find it, amen, here it is. Verse 20. Teacher, he declared, all these commandments I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I want to speak to you on a very strange subject, perhaps. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. Let's pray. Father, I pray that during the next few minutes that you will speak to us, and I pray that our lives will be radically changed by the revelation that your grace surpasses all of our doubts and fears and reservations. We give you glory in Jesus' name that you are friend of sinners. Everybody said Amen. You may be seated. Chapter 10 is a great, great chapter in the Gospels. There's just so much here for us. It's, this chapter begins with a confrontation between Jesus and his friends, the Pharisees. And as usual, the Pharisees are trying to stump Jesus with their questions about the law. How many of you have discovered that we all operate from a position of strength, if at all possible? And when the Pharisees came to Jesus, the only strength they had was their knowledge of the law. They had been trained since they were small boys to know the law of God. And boy, did they know the law. In fact, they had memorized it. A great Pharisee could quote it forwards and backwards. They had studied all of the writings and the commentaries of the rabbis throughout history concerning the law. And so when they came to Jesus, they always tried to operate from a place of strength. And they felt if there was a way to trip him up, they would be able to do it because of their knowledge of the law and perhaps him lacking in knowledge of the law, having been a simple carpenter's son. Verse 2 says, Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? Jesus replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Here's what you have to understand about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when someone is more concerned about appearance than reality. When someone is more concerned about appearance than reality. Verse 5, Jesus answers, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus was talking to men who had worked out a system to justify themselves on every point of the law. Now, before we're too hard on them, don't you understand that that's exactly what we do? 
We try to work out a system, all of us, a rationale that will allow us to justify ourselves on every point of the demands of God. Jesus spent most of his time unraveling the Pharisees' self-image and pointing out the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Now the reason Jesus did that was not because he was trying to show them what was what, but because he is a man who loved sinners. He was the God-man who found sinners irresistible. And if he could just find a self-righteous Pharisee that was willing to admit he was a sinner, then that sinner would qualify himself to be loved and cherished by Almighty God. Some of these leaders had justified leaving their mates because of this certificate of divorce. So Jesus once again humbles them by saying that certificate was because you and your ancestors had hard, unrepentant hearts. You see, the message of the Pharisees is clear. And the message of Jesus to the Pharisees is clear. The message of the Pharisees is I can keep the law and I can justify myself. And the message of Jesus to the Pharisees is you need a Savior. You're a sinner. The next frame in the chapter is of Jesus sitting with a group of children. And I love this part of the chapter as well. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. Verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. The message here is God's kingdom can only be received by those who have childlike faith. Then we have the anchor of this chapter. It's the story of stories, the one that every one of us remember. Actually, it's the story of the day because all of these events happened in one remarkable day of walking with Jesus. Now, the story is known by Bible readers as the story of the rich young ruler. You talk about a guy that had it all, he had it all. He had money, he had power, and he had the youth to enjoy it. Verse 17 says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher or rabbi, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now I want you to see this picture. This young man, who was obviously wealthy and powerful, had a great reputation in the community. I'm sure he was known by the disciples that followed Jesus runs to Jesus. Jesus is on the street. He's just walking among the people and he runs to Jesus and he kneels before him as if he knows he's royalty. He's sincere. There are a lot of good things about this moment. He's humble. He's passionate. He obviously believes that Jesus is God, that he has power. In today's world, it's interesting, isn't it? all of those things would have immediately qualified him at the very highest level of faith and belief. Because the religion of our world is a religion that says we must have faith in people's faith. doesn't matter if you have faith in Jesus Christ or you have faith in Buddha or you have faith in, in Muhammad or you have faith in the Baha'i religion or you have faith in some new age strain of belief, as long as you have the energy to believe, as long as you have passion to believe, as long as you have a code of ethics that you can wrap your life around and it works for you, that's just 
fine. But that's not what we believe, is it? Is that what we will ever believe? The only thing we believe is that he that comes to God, the God, hallelujah, must believe that he alone is God and that he alone is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I want to ask, is there anybody here that still believes that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life? Because I can tell you nothing is more important than believing that. Hallelujah. So the young man is kneeling before Jesus. And he says, good master, rabbi, tell me how I can inherit eternal life. Spoken like a rich kid, right? He's all about inheritance. Tell me. How I can get in a position with you to inherit eternal life. Now what you've got to know is this. The young man has already come to the conclusion that Jesus is divine. Because you don't ask anybody, how can I inherit eternal life unless you understand that they are divine. In fact, Jesus asked him at this moment, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He kind of uncovers him there. There are skeptics and scholars that would say, you see, Jesus didn't even believe that he was God here. Oh, quite the contrary. Jesus at this moment is revealing the heart in this young man who had come to a revelation of the fact that he was divine. That this was God in the flesh. See, Jesus knows this young man's question is not because he thinks there is something else he must do. Now, you've got to get this because I promise you, you've never heard this, but I believe it's from God. His question was not because the young man felt there was something else that he must do. Like the Pharisees earlier in the day, he is very confident in his performance as a law keeper. He has actually knelt before Jesus to get affirmation that he was on the right track. He was actually kneeling there hoping to hear him say, you're one of the ones that will inherit eternal life based on your past performance. So Jesus sets him up to make his case. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Now, how many of you right here in this place can say right along with him that you have kept all these commandments? And let me just stop a second and, and, and let's go back. And see exactly what he said. He said, he said, you shall not murder. I think there's some folks here among us that probably haven't done that yet. You shall not commit adultery. Still some folks that haven't committed adultery. Shall not steal. Some of you never stole a toothpick in your whole life. Shall not give false testimony. You've never stood in a court of law. And given false testimony against anyone or incriminated somebody by a fraudulent testimony. Shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother, and you've done that as well. You see, it's interesting, isn't it, that according to the account that Peter gave to Mark, who was his scribe in writing this book, interesting that Jesus only quoted six of the commandments. Isn't that interesting? But he conspicuously left some of them out. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. The young man continues. Teacher, all of these are those I have kept since I was a boy. I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't fraudulently 
represented anyone. I haven't borne false witness. I, I've kept those. Jesus looked at him, and the word of God said he loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, what you've got to understand about this story is that it's not about the money. It's not about the money. Jesus is pointing out the fact that he's a lawbreaker. Jesus is pointing out the fact that there is another God that he's worshiping. That there is an idol in his life. That while he's kept most of those commandments and is very proud of doing that, that the most powerful commandments of all having to do with the deity of God and the fact that we're to worship him and him alone, he has shattered them with his love of the things of this world. See, what you've got to understand is that Jesus was always intent on holding the mirror, as Paul referred to it, in front of everyone he met, especially the religiously secure. The Pharisees came to make their case. They thought that they were experts in the law, but they didn't understand that they were speaking to the very one who was the Word made flesh and dwelling among us. And they stood there confident in who they were, and Jesus just held up the law. And they were able to see the blemishes on their character, and they would find themselves melting into the crowd every time. And this young man came confident that he was a candidate for eternal life. After all, everything had worked out for him in life. He had never, ever missed. He was making A pluses on all the tests that mattered in life. And as he stood there, Jesus just held the law up and allowed him to see himself. And what he saw was one who was a lawbreaker. And the word of God said, he went away sorrowfully. You see, brothers and sisters, every one of us need to come to this conclusion. We are all sinners. We will never, ever be recommended to God because of anything we have done to make our own selves righteous. God is not interested in all of your rule keeping. That is not what will ever qualify you. You have not come into the kingdom of God to get kingdom lessons of how to walk perfectly before the Almighty. No, you have come to the kingdom of God to have the king of the kingdom fill you and begin to walk out the strength of the gospel in spite of your utter incapability and total weakness. The disciples were amazed at his words. Verse 24. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, the response of the disciples gives away what Jesus was actually referring to. He wasn't just talking about money because the disciples, the Bible says, were even more amazed and they said to each other, who then can be saved? They're not concerned about the rich man any longer. They're concerned about themselves. Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, and I want you to hear this, folks. 
because this should clear it up for all of you that feel like somehow you can recommend yourself to God because of your good life and your great behavior and the fact that you've been a diligent rules keeper. Those of you that feel that somehow maybe you're a little ahead of the other guy to the right or the left because they've struggled a little more in areas than you have struggled, I want you to hear what Jesus says because this is the summary of all summaries when it comes to works and grace. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible. Possible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Somebody thank God for the grace of God. Somebody thank God that He is the friend of sinners. Now, this story has been used many times to illustrate the deception of riches. And Jesus did say it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus makes the summary statement of all summary statements to tie up all the loose ends. Who can be saved? With man, it's impossible. Hallelujah. I always want to say that you can't behave well enough to be saved. It's impossible. Somebody say, that's the good news. I just want to say this to you. I know some of you are ashamed of your attitude over the last few day, days. You are not disqualified. You serve the friend of sinners. And what I can promise you is this. You will want to be like him if you can be in his presence. You won't need a law to control that. You will want to turn away from sin if you get in his presence because he is so amazing. He draws you like a celestial magnet to his character. You will want to think like him. You will want to act like him. You will want to speak like him. You will not need a sword dangling precariously over your head so that you might live in that kind of fear. Oh, my friend, no. You will will want to be like him simply because he is altogether glorious and wonderful and beautiful. And when you see his grace, you'll know it's impossible to attain it. But oh, hallelujah, you serve a God who says, I don't care how rebellious you've been. I don't care how sinful you've been. I don't care how many times you've broken your vows. I am the God who says, all things are possible with me. Hallelujah. It's not about money. It's about the pride of thinking you can add to God's grace. The story's not about the money. It's about loving anything more than the master. It's not about the money. It's about the deception of thinking you're righteous on your own. It's impossible with man for anybody to be saved. But with God, all things are possible. <sighs> Hallelujah. Can you lift your hands and say, thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Say, thank you for writing my name in the book of life. Say, thank you for doing what I could not do. Verse 21 is, of course, my favorite verse in the whole <laughs> chapter. The Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him. You can't just jump over stuff like that when you're reading the Bible, folks. You've got you to gotta ask questions. The Holy Spirit will answer them for you if you'll ask them. Jesus <laughs> looked at him and loved him. He loved him knowing he was deceived. I want to tell you something, Mom and Dad. You're praying for that kid of yours out there, and they're deceived. As Jesus looks at him. And he may start in a bar early this morning in some city in America. But I want you to understand as he looks at him, he looks at him and loves him. 
He loved this young man knowing he was deceived. He loved him knowing he was about to make a wrong choice. Knowing he was about to take a left instead of a right. He loved him. How many of you are feeling the grace of God wash over this place right now? Because I want to tell you that's what's happening. Hallelujah. He loved him with his idols. He loved him unconditionally and irrevocably. You say, well, did that save him? No. But what you've got to understand is that God loved you every day of your lost life before you ever bowed a knee of repentance. He never stopped loving you. He is a friend of sinners. And all Jesus needed was for that self-righteous young man to become a sinner in his own eyes in need of a Savior. You see, there is only one group of people in this place that can really get right with God, and those are the people that know they're not right with God. You see, some of you are just like this man, and you're just like that Pharisee. You've been doing everything you could to justify your actions. You've compared yourself to the person to the left or the right, your next-door neighbor, your buddy from high school. You're not doing as bad as him. And yet what you need to understand is that doesn't get you anything with Jesus because Jesus is just looking for a sinner who will admit they're a sinner because he loves sinners. In fact, the Pharisees criticized him because he ate with publicans and sinners. Now the word for eat there in the Greek actually means made festivity with. They didn't have a problem probably with him just having a snack with a sinner. What bothered the Pharisees is that Jesus was having too good a time with those folks. He was laughing with sinners. He was enjoying sinners. He knew sinners by their first names. He knew what was happening in the homes of sinners. He understood that there were people who were sinners that had little children that he was praying for to his father on those long nights when he would steal away for his private time. Jesus just loved the company of sinners. And what you've got to understand is if you're here and you're a sinner, that Jesus isn't pushing you away. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to love you. And even walking this aisle, it won't be the first time that he found out what your name was or what was going on in your life. Oh, now I can be involved in their lives because they've repented. Oh, no, long before you repent, Jesus loved you just like you are. And I want to say to some of you Christian sinners, look at me. Jesus loves you and your sin too. Now, is he going to try to clean you up? Yes, because the wages of sin are death. You earn death when you sin. God doesn't send it to you. You just earn it. It's the wage of sin. But the Word of God says the gift of life is, li is eternal. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What I want you to understand is that God wants to do away with the sin in your life so that you can live life to the fullest and sin will always be handicapping. But while you're dealing with sin, He loves you. While you're dealing with bondage, He loves you. While you feel less than, He loves you. While you walk in shame, He loves you. Because Jesus loves sinners. This is what I can tell you. When I finally woke up in my college classes from time to time, and became interested in the subject matter, there were two driving forces that would cause me to ask a question. One was that I really wanted to know the answer of something, but that would not force me to ask that question because there was another factor, and that was confidence <laughs> in the kindness, friendliness, and openness of that lecturer. If I was intimidated by him, or her, I never ask a question because I was afraid to be embarrassed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
But if I had confidence that they liked me, come on now. I mean, it was wonderful. I had a college uh, professor, and she just loved my roommate and me. She loved us. She, um, she had to leave halfway through the semester. She and her husband, uh, she and her husband were having their first child, and you know, Huey, my roommate, and I, we sent her candy while she was in the hospital, and you know, and we just. You know, she had some complications, and we were always, you know, we, we just loved her. Let me just tell you something. We couldn't ask a stupid question in that lady's class. We were wonderful in her eyes. So anything we asked, she was there. And you know, that's the way some of you have felt about God all your life, honestly. You feel because of your failure because of your sin, because of your shortcomings, because you've never been quite able to overcome something that he just looks at you with a scowl and with condemnation. And if he were to say anything to you, it would be like, something about you really bothers me, honestly. That's what you feel he's saying. And you're so very, very wrong. All I can tell you is that I, as a father, love my children. And I pay them all attention. But if I've got a child that is going through a particularly tough struggle, then he's got or she's got most of my attention. I not only love them, I'm just waiting for the opportunity to help heal them. That's the way your heavenly Father loves you. I am so moved by a Lord who would look at this rich young man who probably everyone in the community envied. Some people hated him just because of his station in life. He was probably a spoiled brat. He probably felt he deserved eternal life. And yet Jesus looked at him with all of his flaws and said, Man, I love this one. And that's how he loves you. Let me close by telling you a couple of stories that I, that I feel are related. I always respected and loved my coaches. and I had great coaches throughout my life. I had great, great coaches as a player. I remember... Uh, being in the Washington Redskins camp in 1976, and my coach was George Allen. Wow, what a leader. What a man. He had such character, such class. When he walked down those halls of our training camp in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, he just demanded respect from everybody without saying a word. But I remember when God spoke to me to leave professional football. Just in one day, the Lord spoke to me to leave. And I went to Coach Allen and I said, Coach, I said, I've always played football for the glory of God. I said, I don't know if you understand anything like that, but that's the reason I played. And I always knew the day would come when the Lord would tell me to leave. And this is the day that I feel that the Lord has told me to leave professional football. And so I've just come to thank you. And I want to I want to thank you for assigning me to a contract. I want to thank you for uh, having the opportunity to be here in this great, great uh, environment with this amazing team. And I, I said, and I can tell you, you were not uh, overstated as a leader and a coach in my estimation. I've, I've loved being here with you. And then I looked at him and I said, Coach, uh, I've just got one question to ask you. Have you ever been born again? At that point, Coach Allen said this to me. No, I'm, I believe, but I've, I've never, uh, I don't think I've been born again. Now, now I, I have a chapel here for my team. And, and we meet every week during the season. And I don't know if you've heard of Tom Skinner, but Tom Skinner is our chaplain. And I, I'll tell you. I just believe everything Tom Skinner says. I, he began to go through a litany of things that had to do with his life and with the caliber of man that he was all true. He was everything in that moment 
but a sinner. Not understanding that our Savior is only looking for sinners. He's not looking for good men. He's not looking for high caliber character. He, he's not looking for those that have kept their own code of ethics to the letter. He's just looking for a sinner to save. I um, shook his hand and he said, well, we're going to give you a big chance against Baltimore this weekend. I said, I know, coach. And I said, that's so tempting. I said, but you know, it's time for me to leave. And I said, thank you again. And I, I, I walked out with my heart heavy because I would have loved in that moment for Coach Allen to be able to just become a sinner. A few years later, I was back working a camp at Louisiana Tech. And my uh, head coach, Maxie Lambright, had experienced some physical problems. And our um, offensive line coach came to me, and, and Wallace Martin had always been like the heart and soul of, of the believers of every generation of, of Tech football players since I had been there. He loved God and was headed up the FCA. And he came to me and he said, Denny, he said, I'm concerned about Maxie. I said, well, so am I. He said, well, I think you need to talk to him about his soul. I said, you know, that's been on my heart, but I thought maybe you should talk to him about his soul. I said, you are with him all the time. He said, no, Denny. He said, there's no one but you to talk to him about his soul. And you are here this week, and I believe that it is God that you're here. And I want you to go and talk to Maxie. Maxie's a very proud man. Uh, had great charisma. I, I've never seen a coach that would keep could keep as many type A personalities on his coaching staff together and happy and effective like that man could do. I mean, he was just that intimidating it's the truth he was the kind of guy that when he walked in the room none of us wanted him looking at us and that's the truth we call him the blue max because he had these piercing blue eyes and when he turned to look at you it probably wasn't good we just would soon as as he looked somewhere else that day i walked in and i sat before his desk and i suddenly felt like a small child alone with my coach <clears throat> Hey, Denny, what can I do for you? I said, well, coach, I said, uh, I've, I've, come to, I've come here because I'm, I'm concerned about you. I'm worried about you. And I, I didn't know how to lead. You know, I, how many of you have ever been that intimidated that you, you didn't even know how to start, you know? So I, he said, do I look that bad, son? I said, no, you don't look bad at all, coach. I said, this is what I'm concerned about, coach. I'm concerned about whether or not you've ever given your heart to Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever given your heart to Jesus. In that moment, I watched this proud man just become a sinner. And he, he looked at me and he said, What do you want me to do, Denny? I said, well, coach, what I really want is I want you to, I want you to kneel with me and pray with me. And I want you to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. He looked at me and he said, I will. And I walked over to take his hand. And when I did, he slipped out of that big padded chair onto his knees like the most humble sinner you have ever seen and I took the hands of my head coach and I led him to Jesus you see what was that all about only one thing it's not about the money it's about becoming a sinner because only sinners get to know a Savior. And ladies and gentlemen, it's time for some of you 
to stop running as sinners from God, you need to understand He just loves hanging out with sinners. And if you will allow Him, He will transform your life and become the moment that changes everything for you. And it will happen today. Now before you stand with me, let me say just a couple of more things. During the next few minutes, it will only be about one thing. And that is whether some of you are willing to be sinners like you are. You're willing to be honest. Say, I'm a sinner. And if he loves sinners, he's going to love me. (laughs) If he loves to hang out with sinners, then I qualify. And if he saves sinners, then you bet I want him to save me. I don't want to be that sinner that loses out on being saved by Jesus. Quietly, will you just bow your heads all over this place? On the count of three, I'm going to ask you one question. Are you ready to get right with God? You might be a religious sinner. You might be someone who's never darkened the door of a church before. You might be fighting an addiction, but you say, Pastor, I'm just just ready for, for Jesus to love me right where I am, and I'm ready to get right with God. Now, I'm not saying it won't be a process, because for some of you it will. I'm not saying it won't take a while hanging out with Jesus for a lot of the things to really change. But I want to tell you, He'll be there with you every second. It's all over this place. You say, Pastor Denny, (laughs) I want to get right with God. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. Jesus is just looking for some sinners today. One, two, three. Raise your hand all over this place. You say, it's me, it's me. Raise your hand all over this place, all over this place. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, there are hands up everywhere. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want everybody sitting right in your chair, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And I want everyone all around you to pray it. You ready? Dear Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry. I am a sinner. And I know you're looking for me. Well, here I am. And I'm willing to admit it because we both know it's the truth. And I ask that you cleanse me from my sins and that you make me brand new. I want to live my life for you. I really do. But I know it's impossible. But with you, all things are possible. And so I ask you to do what I cannot do. Transform me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I will give you glory. I declare, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. And that will never change. As your heads are bowed. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.